So welcome everybody. I'm really excited about today. This happened very organically and um, I've met Mark and his team and Lori and her team and Dr. Williams works with me. And so we really decided that this would be such an educational piece to be able to give to the masses about mold, the top things that you should know about mold. Um, so I'm gonna start off by introducing our panelists. Um, so we have Dr. Williams here. Dr. Sarah Williams is a naturopathic medical doctor. She specializes in chronic illnesses, gut health, as well as mold toxicity. She received her medical degree from Bastyr University, California, and she provides care to clients at Modern Med, which is our telehealth company that we both work at. Doctor, oh, that was the only doctor on the team, but we've got, <laughs> we have Mark Levy, who's, we could call him a mold doctor for sure. He is the founder of Mold Guys. Um, Mark Levy, for over the last 18 years, the Mold Guy has specialized in working with people who are hypersensitive and have complex health issues, which is really a big overlap for what we do here at Modern Med. Um, Mark is certified by the American Council for Accredited Certifications, ACAC. The Certification Council is North America's oldest and most prestigious certifying body dedicated to indoor air quality. The ACAC is accredited by the prestigious certification for Engineering and Scientific Technicians Board and National Commissions for Certifying Agencies. So welcome, Mark, as well. Thank you. Looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. And then we have Lori Young. So Lori is a certified restoration expert that specializes in cleaning personal property that has been affected by mold or mold spores. Services offered include consulting, cleaning, packing, moving, and more all around the mold. And she's gonna really talk about that and how cleaning can be really important in this process. So she features the Sporta ES 3300 wash system for laundering and soft contents, which is a full service cleaning facility that can tailor to each individual's needs and services in the SoCal area. And then me, so I'm Dr. Mary Pardee, I'm the founder of Modern Med, and I'm just going to be the host today asking all of these awesome questions, which I'm honored to be able to do. And um, I just wanted to really just talk about my own journey with mold really briefly and like why I think that mold is important. So I actually grew up in a house that was 300 years old. And so Mark will probably shudder at that because the basement was made of stones with no insulation. I mean, there was, you could see the soil actually in between the stones. It was not sealed whatsoever. Um, there was always a level of water on the basement floor. It was really a cellar, I would call it. Um, and it smelt musty. There was visible signs of not just moisture, but actually sometimes inches of water on the floor. I believe as a kid at one point, we might've tried to even like row with a boat in our basement. Um, <laughs> And so like, was there mold? Yes, of course there was mold, just being an old house and then having that, that cellar component to it. I had chronic sinusitis, so really recurrent sinus infections as a kid. My mom, my brother did as well. And I have no doubts that uh, that was linked to the mold there. Um, I was able to move out of the house when I went to college and didn't have any symptoms thereafter. And really, I might have got maybe one more sinus infection in my entire life, but things really dissipated after that for me. And so it was a clear link. And my big takeaway message there was your environment matters. And we can extrapolate this to not just mold, but also the people you surround yourself with, as well as where you decide to make your home. And, and so then we have this mold webinar. And my, my caveat with this webinar is that mold is really important to consider in your health, but it's not the entire piece of the puzzle, right? So it's just a piece of the puzzle, I should say. It's not the entire picture. So we always wanna make sure that we're doing comprehensive testing. We're looking at the whole picture and is something else a bigger cause for your symptoms? Is mold just a piece of it? Or you know, is this actually a really big part of your health picture? But it's usually a combination of physical health, the health of your environment, your relationships, your mental health, and your spiritual health, which is one of the mottos of modern men. So we are going to dive in, and I really organize this as how we see people handle mold. And so usually people are coming into us at Modern Med, and they're talking to Dr. Sarah, and they're saying, you know, these are my symptoms, and she may then offer mold testing. So I want to start with you, Dr. Williams, and just go over the basics of mold. Is mold everywhere? You know, why is it such a big deal? And what is actually doing inside of our bodies? 
Yes, great question. So mold is a fungus and it thrives off of moisture. It reproduces through spores that travel through the air. And it actually plays a really important beneficial role in nature. It helps with our healthy soil. It helps break down dead matter like leaves. But unfortunately, we're seeing that it's becoming really rampant indoors and causing all of these toxic symptoms. And so one of the reasons that this happened is actually in the 70s, we started changing the way that we were constructing our buildings. And we built them so tightly together that they're not able to breathe properly and the humidity is less controlled. So a leak that would normally be able to dry out is not able to, and then mold builds up over time. So we're seeing that it's in over 50% of homes these days. And I think that that's one of the reasons for that. But we're seeing that when a person is exposed to mold, it produces these toxins that we call mycotoxins. And that's what's causing the problem in our bodies. So normally the mycotoxin will be tagged by the immune system and broken down and removed by the liver from our bodies. If we have too much too much toxic overload, or if we have certain genetic predispositions, which we'll get into in a little bit, then we aren't going to be tagging them appropriately, and then they'll remain in our body and really start to cause symptoms. So the toxin will end up binding to different receptors in our body, like toll-like receptors, and upregulate inflammatory pathways, like cytokines, TGF, beta, and then they start to affect our nerves. They cause oxidative stress, which is cellular death and damage to our cells and DNA, and then they're also wrecking havoc on our immune system. So that's what it's doing from a physiological standpoint when we're exposed to too much inside. Yeah, and so I think that's fascinating. It's I haven't really heard about, you know, the change in actual construction when it comes to, you know, why mold is more of an issue right now, which I'm sure Mark, do you have anything to to add to that piece of it? Well, I think it's really important when you're dealing with mold. Obviously, the the, the key thing that uh, she Dr. Williams talked about was moisture. Moisture is going to be the reason why you have any kind of mold growth. And what happens is is that many times people will have an event there would be some type of water, maybe a pipe that was leaking or some water intrusion issues. And the first thing that they're gonna do is maybe try to deal with the leak itself and then let it dry out naturally, which is going to be a problem because over time, what happens is, is that you're going to have these microbes, whether it be certain kinds of molds or even bacteria, that can actually develop uh, if it's not dried out properly. So the key is gonna be Moisture, moisture control is the main number one uh, type of uh, focus that you wanna make sure that you take care of. So me swimming in a boat in my cellar, there was a little bit of moisture down there. Yeah, it was quite a bit of moisture down there. I will <laughs> tell you that this is another thing that people aren't really aware of is that even though you may, and it sounds like you spent much time down in the basement area, even if you're not spending time in the basement, a home is a living, breathing system. So what happens through pressurization, through air movement and so forth, whatever's going on in the basement is going to make its way up into your living space. Mm. And not only that, many times you have the uh, ventilation system, the heating and air conditioning system, the furnace is housed in your basement. So that's the lungs of the home. So now you, you have this particular unit as it's operational, it's pulling things in, certainly from the surroundings that it's in, and it's being able to have that distributed throughout your, uh, your living space as well. Yes, yeah. Um, we got uh, Lori back on the line. If you can just mute yourself. Sorry, guys. Lori, it's okay. Um, yeah. But, okay, so I want to bring this back. Dr. Williams, you mentioned um, mycotoxins coming up. But with your explanation, what I realized is that it's not just about mycotoxins. It's not just about the actual mold, but also the interaction with that in your immune system and then the inflammatory process that takes place. And so we have to take into consideration that this is not just detoxing from mold, but also how to reduce inflammation and how to balance the immune system and empower the immune system to actually be able to function properly to detoxify itself, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so how do you actually know if you have mold toxicity? Like, let's talk about some of the general symptoms. If you see a patient that comes in, what are those things that you're looking for, you know, that tip you off that this could be mold? Yep. So a big one is also asking the patient when their symptoms first started. So if they started having symptoms when they moved to their new home or they started working in a new environment, that's a big 
um, a big problem that I start to think of mold. Um, but then also some of the symptoms, they can be so widespread and they can mimic so many other conditions. So it takes some teasing out to get to the bottom of that. But chronic fatigue, having to take naps, can't get out of bed in the morning, that's a big one. It really tends to affect our brain. So having some memory cognitive dysfunction and ability to find words, um, it's actually been linked to Alzheimer's and dementia. So they found that in these patients with dementia, up to one third of those patients had mold as a contributing factor. So that's a big one that sets me off. Um, respiratory issues is a huge one. 87% of people have respiratory issues that have mold contamination. So shortness of breath, cough, sinus congestion, asthma is a big one. That's actually the most common cause for adult asthma. Um, so that's some, some really big ones I'm seeing with patients. Some interesting ones that I'm seeing that we don't typically think of is that mold will affect our ADH hormone. So that's our antidiuretic hormone and it controls our salt and our hydration status. So it, mold will pretty much make it so that we're not producing enough ADH hormone. And then we have increased thirst, increased urination, and we won't be able to stay hydrated. And that can lead to a lot of muscle cramps because our electrolytes are thrown off. It can lead to edema and swelling in our lower limbs. And then an interesting one is that it can actually lead to electric shocks especially on our extremities, like our arms. So that's one that I'm seeing in patients when they say that I'm like, ding, ding, ding. That's a big yeah. one. So, and that's because we're actually excreting too much chloride in our sweat. Wow. Yeah. Those are really fascinating. The thirst and the urination, uh, cause you're much more of a mold expert than I am, but those are like the key ones that I ask for first, but the, the shocks, you know, that's a really interesting one due to the chloride. Um, but yeah, when I hear thirst and urination, like those are my two ones that I'm like, mm -hmm, does this person need to see Dr. Williams? Um, <laughs> amazing. Okay. So, you know, we know the symptoms and they can be really widespread so that actually it's still tough to tease out. So if you suspect it, but you don't want to go ahead and just treat empirically, how are you actually going to test the person for mold? Yes. So there's two main ways that I'm testing for mold. And one of them is through a urine mycotoxin test. So that's when we're actually looking at the toxins you're excreting through your urine. And this test is best done if we are doing it in a provoked way, meaning that we're having you take liposomal glutathione, which breaks up the mold and helps detox it from your system so that you are actually urinating it out. Sometimes what we see is if we're not doing that provoked test and a person is very toxic, then we might get a false negative because they're not able to even excrete it yet at that point. So um, I'm really using real-time labs, urine mycotoxin tests. That's my favorite. They're using a very specific type of technology called ELISA, which is an enzyme-linked amino assay, and it's found to be the most sensitive and specific. Um, there's also Great Plains, which I do sometimes as well. It's a little bit more affordable, so I use that in some of my patients for that reason. Um, but that's one of the main ways I'm doing it. And then also, Dr. Richie Shoemaker is really great in the mold realm and came out with a huge protocol. He has a really great website. It's called survivingmold.com. But he actually tests through a series of blood work. So these are different markers that are telling us how our immune system is functioning and if we are really ramped up and in a hyperdrive immune state. Some of these, I won't go into detail with them, but we can always talk about that another time, um, are things like MMP, TGF beta, really telling us if you are in a high chronic immune active state. Um, VEGF, looking at our complement 4A, also tells us that you have a high toxic load. MSH is a big one. We talked about ADH as well. And then actually, we can really see that these people might become gluten sensitive and be reactive to anti-gliadin which is when we start to have leaky gut and reactions to gluten. So that's another one as well. So you're testing through the urine almost always to see if mold is present, but then there's additional blood tests that we can do that are really focusing on, you know, is the immune system working and can we see signs of mold that is affecting the immune system as well? Um, and I think it is important to, to mention that sometimes we're not doing all of these tests. So sometimes we'll have people that watch webinars like this and, you know, why aren't we doing all these tests? Sometimes it can be thousands of dollars to do all of the tests. Um, and sometimes we don't need all of that information too. So sometimes it's based on the person and would this lead to actionable things? Or are we going to do the same thing regardless of if we test it or not? That's a very good point. And that's usually why I'm really doing the urine mycotoxin as my primary, but I think it can be helpful as well to look at how your immune system is activated and what else is going on.
Yeah, especially um, there's, there are definitely functional medicine clinics that you walk in and you get a million tests right off the bat and they're testing everybody for mold, they're testing everybody for this. And I see the value in that. And I think it can be um, really interesting as the clinician to be able to get all of that information. But price point wise, you are talking about thousands of dollars there. Sometimes it's too much information, meaning that if you're not going to act on things, then you just have this information present. Um, and then also potentially over treating the patient where they are on a million supplements at once versus let's tackle the biggest thing first and then move on to things if they still are hanging around afterwards. And sometimes when you fix one thing, it actually acts as a domino effect and really helps things um, down the line as well. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. It can be tricky in those situations. Yeah. But let's go into, um, let's, let, let's, you know, kind of start going into the treatments of this. So somebody comes back, they are positive for mold. What are their treatment options looking like? So really the biggest thing that I educate my patients on is removing yourself from the environment or fixing the environment. That's really going to be the biggest thing that alone is going to help you significantly heal. And unfortunately that might not be feasible for the patient at the time, maybe finances or whatever it may be. And that's a really hard thing for patients to accept, but that's really the biggest thing that we can do. And then we can naturally support our detoxification system. Um, the main things that I'm really using is a binder. We can use pharmaceutical binders like cholestyramine or Wellcall. I often use more natural binders because I think they're better tolerated and less harsh on our system, like activated charcoal, zeolite clay, citrus pectin. Those are really great as well. That's going to bind the mold from our system that's stored in our fat tissue or our organs make sure that you're excreting it properly. We need to make sure that you're having at least one bowel movement a day in those cases because we need to make sure that we're actually getting the toxins out. We don't want them to start recirculating and causing more damage. So that's a big one that we have to make sure before we initiate binders on board. I also do use liposomal glutathione. It's the most potent antioxidant that our body makes, and it naturally gets depleted if we have too high of a toxic load. And it also will help break up that mold and get it out of your system faster. So I really like those. I am sometimes using antifungals. So whether that's pharmaceutical antifungals like Nystatin or Fluconazole, um, we can also use more natural ones like undulinic acid is one that I use often. And then sauna. Infrared sauna is going to be your best friend in these cases. It's one of the most well-researched things to help get mold out of your system. So we need to get you sweating. Also, like I said, having those regular bowel movements, really working on those detoxification systems to get things moving out. Those are some of the biggest things. Um, you know, we can add on supportive nutrients as well. Fish oil is a really great one, especially with a higher DHA component. It's really important, especially if we are having brain symptoms like, you know, depression or memory issues. It's going to be really supportive. Yeah, those are all, uh, those are all really important. And I think you probably tailor it based on the person, right? And kind of if other things are going on as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and so we have all of these treatment options. There's also advanced treatment things as well that we don't do at Modern Med, but we'll sometimes refer out to. Do you want to just mention those just so people know them and that there are an option? Yep, so they can be really great at speeding healing. Some of them are ozone, which is when we are actually oxygenating your blood, and then hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be really great as well. And that's just when we are giving you 100% oxygen and really speeding up that healing process. So if someone you know, is very chronically exposed, having severe symptoms or being resistant to some of these basic treatments, then we kind of take it to that next step. Something else that I'm adding on sometimes too is that mold can really reside in our nasal and sinus passages. And so especially if someone is having chronic sinusitis, sometimes I'm adding on like a colloidal silver spray or even a BEG spray is what we call it, but it's EDTA, which is a binding agent, and then antimicrobials, antibiotics to help break that up and get it out of our system that way that can be hard to get rid of when it's in our sinus passages. Yeah, yeah. And we will come back. I think I want to circle around and talk about Marcons. And so I just want to throw that out there in case we don't have time. Um, but if you have questions about it, that is a test 
um, as well that we, we can add in for people that we suspect that with. Um, but one of the other things that you're usually putting in somebody's treatment plan at this point, once mold comes back positive, is that they need to figure out if the mold is in their house, if it was in their past house, if it's in their office, and that's where Mark and his team come in. Um, and so we're, we're referring to the mold guys for really assessment of what's going on there, what are the levels, and then you know what are the options from there out. So Mark, people, when they come to you, you know, how do you describe what makes the mold guy disruptors in the indoor air quality industry? What makes you guys stand out from others? Because there's so many testing options available if you put into Google mold testing for my home. That's a great question because you're right. There's a lot of alternatives out there in terms of what people can do as far as uh, calling on uh, mold inspection companies, but we're not your typical mold inspection company. The most important thing that we can really give, a, give ourselves in terms of differentiation is our entire approach. What we've done is that we've actually created an, a program or a process in terms of inspection to really understand your home from the top to bottom. And that's, that's really important because at the end of the day, what happens is, is that you hire certain types of companies that are out there and they come in and they do very cursory inspections. Uh, they will come in, maybe spend about 30 minutes, look around, and then put up some air samples and then compare it to the outdoors. And at that point, uh, try to interpret whether there's been an impact in your home or not which is going to give you a, a major false sense of security. What we've done is that we've actually gone up until COVID hit up to about five or six medical conferences a year. So we really understand the profile in terms of your particular patient, what they're going through, the illnesses that they're dealing with. And what we've done is that we've created not just a very comprehensive approach in terms of looking and observing throughout the home, but we've actually come up with an entire what I call sampling uh, program or methodology that really gives you a very good in that understanding of what's going on in your home and what you're being exposed to. So when you're dealing with a home, if I can actually get into it uh, from the beginning, the most important thing that you want to be able to do is understand the history of a home. Just like you sit down with your patient, you want to understand their history. We want to understand the history of the home as well. And this is very critical. You're dealing with homes, many times homes are many, many years old. And so some of these people have been in there for maybe a few years or a number of years or what have you, but they're going to be certain situations where you're not gonna know the entire history of your home, but you're gonna to have to really try to think as hard as you can about certain events that have occurred along the way that you may have been impacted to. So it's really the events and understanding different types of moisture issues that you might have had, maybe a certain leak that was uh, actually occurred at one time, maybe a breach in the building envelope. Those are gonna be all key indicators for us to be able to understand in terms of what's been going on historically. So we start, when we do our inspections, we always begin on the outside of a property because the building envelope is the most important thing to be able to protect. So we're gonna look on the outside, we're gonna look at the grading, the landscaping, the exterior walls, the windows, all the potential infiltration points. We're gonna call out and point out any type of information that we see that could be areas of where moisture can be making its way into that building envelope. And then for preventative measures, we're gonna actually have you take a look at those things to try to correct. And then we're gonna come inside and what we're gonna do is that we're gonna look through high-tech instrumentation, look for the existence of moisture or a history of moisture. Now history is very important because I call them footprints, staining, paint peeling, buckling, separation of building materials. These are all what I call indicators of certain types of uh, what I call water damage issues where mold can be harboring. And what people don't understand is, is that it's not just the fact that you are looking to see if you have moisture, but it's the history that's really important because even though the water may go away, what ha happens is, is that if there was a growth of some type of mold, well, it's not gonna go away, it's gonna stay there. And I would argue that the fact remains that when you're dealing with mold that is older mold and it starts to dry out, it becomes more of a problem because what happens is, is that these microbes start to fragment and as they fragment, they start to create fine particles 
that are easier to become airborne, which then become it, throughout the year, they start to traverse and then they settle throughout the home. And now you're dealing with issues in terms of a full impact. So what we do is that we're coming in and we're looking for what we would consider to be source areas where the mold is actually uh, harboring. And many times what happens is, is that you can't even see the mold. It's going to be behind the walls. It's going to be inside cabinetry, underneath carpet. So understanding the history, knowing where it originated from and where it migrated to is going to be important. Looking for those footprints in terms of the areas of what we just talked about in terms of water damage, looking for things that are unusual substances are going to be very important. And sometimes even the most superficial thing to somebody, it could be the tip of an iceberg and we want to be able to take a look at those things. So um, those are key indicators in terms of what you want to look for. Certainly you want to use your senses in terms of any types of smell, because if you're smelling something, that's going to be an indicator that there's something that's going on there. And then obviously the eyes and being able to see what you see. And then once we do that, we look for, as I mentioned, what we call source areas, but we also want to take a full impact. And this is where we actually have created a major differentiation in terms of our company versus other companies. And that is, is that we use more progressive sampling methodologies. What people may or may not understand is that there's two different forms of contamination. There is the physical growth of the mold, which is the colonies themselves. And then there's the secondary byproducts, the spores, the fragmentation, and these toxins that actually become airborne and they traverse through the air and they settle throughout. That settlement settles within what we call dust reservoirs. And it's the dust that's our enemy. The dust harbors all the spores, the fragmentations, and these toxins. And so what we do is that we're actually utilizing more progressive sampling methods, such as I'm sure many people have heard of ERMI, which is really a very good sampling methodology because it's the most sensitive form for detection and identification of the various types of spores of molds as well as the species. And what we look for is not just that you have mold, but if you have some type of illness, it's important not to know that you just have mold, but it's the species because it's the species that determines the opportunistic nature. All molds in themselves are known allergens. Certain molds can certainly be pathogenic and others can be toxigenic and produce what we call a mycotoxin. So we actually utilize the ERMI as a DNA formatting because it gives us the speciations of what's there, a panel of 36 molds that are broken up into two different groups. And so you have 26 that are water damaged, and then you have these other that are common molds. But the beauty behind it is, is that now you have certain types of species that can be correlated to various types of mycotoxins that can be produced. And so if you are a doctor and you have these patients that basically are coming up with certain types of levels of ochratoxin A, or coming up with certain levels of trichothecene or other types of, of mycotoxins, you can correlate that particular report to see if those types of molds have the ability to produce the types of mycotoxins that are in their body. So that's a real good type of tool to be able to use in conjunction with the clinicals that you're doing. We can also test for 15 different types of mycotoxins. Because uh, they produce it doesn't necessarily mean that they have produced it. So we would certainly want to know if that production has been created within that environment. Now, this is important. What we try to do is that we try to provide data. That's what our whole emphasis is in terms of understanding what's going on within your home, where the impact happens to be, but more importantly, what you're being exposed to and does it have an impact that you can basically share this data with your doctor. So the other critical component that many people leave out is bacteria. See, the true primary colonizer in a water event, it's not mold. Mold can take upwards of 24 to 48 hours, but bacteria can grow within hours. And depending upon the type of water, what I call water category, category of water loss, will determine if there is certain types of uh, bacteria that can grow. So we could test for various types of bacteria, one being uh, what we call from gram-negative bacteria, which is endotoxins. And I'm sure you know that en these endotoxins, if they get into the body, they can actually wreak havoc on the GI tract and create gut issues. And then also you have
I don't know if Mark froze or if that is me. He froze on my end too. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I actually, it's a good place for us to pause right now because I wanted to highlight some of the things that he said during that. Cause that was like, inf I'm like taking notes over here um, because it was an information bomb, which was amazing. Um, I think some of the highlights were making sure that you have a, a house history. I was going to say health history, but a house history. We do health histories. He does house <laughs> histories in terms of, you know, what has happened in your house. And I think we don't really talk about that, but if you had a leak one year, you know, or if you had something happen, you know, with your bathtub or all of these things can give you clues as to what to tell Mark and his team and where they want to make sure that they're looking for evidence um, and so I think that's one of the big takeaways. And then the other one that I found very interesting was the discussion about how dry mold and actually areas that have seemed to be like fixed and not currently moist or a problem area right now are just as problematic, if not more problematic than the actual wet areas are because of the ability for that dry dust to actually create an airborne or become airborne and spread throughout the house. So I think that those were two of my big takeaways there. And um, Dr. Williams, you were, sh you were nodding your head at one point in terms of all the things that he was saying. Did you have anything that you wanted to chime in there with? I just really agreed with what he said. What I do so often with patients is I do the urine mycotoxin test and then I'm like, okay, this is somewhere in your environment. I recommend you go to see the mold guys and get it tested. And we see the correlation every time I've done it, which makes sense obviously, but it is just interesting and it's very confirmatory. And it's especially helpful too, if people are living in an apartment and maybe they have a landlord, they don't own their place. You know, it's important to be able to give that information to the person who does own the building. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so now while we wait for Mark to come back on, Lori, this is a good time for us to talk to you in terms of, you know, when people come back and they've already seen the mold guy, they've already seen us, they know that they have mold in, the, you know, in their bodies and they're being affected health-wise, and then they also know that it's in their home. Um, do they need to throw away all of their belongings? This is one of the most common questions that we actually get as practitioners, but can you break that down in terms of how does somebody decide and go through this process? Oh. Guys, I'm sorry, we got dropped off. Technical You're difficulties. I don't know what happened, but at any rate, maybe it was time for me to stop anyway. So there you yeah, go. we're going to break to Lori really quick and then I'm going to bring it back to you. Um, okay. Mark. Oh, you're muted still, Lori. So just unmute yourself first. Technical. There we Better? go. Yep. Okay. Let me mute this one, I think. Nope, you're mute. You muted yourself again, I think. <laughs> okay. Better? Yep. You're good. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so no, they don't have to throw everything away. You know, what I find by the time people get to this point, they're exhausted. They've been to the doctor. They know they're sick. They really don't know where to begin. They've had the mold guys out. All of it has scared, the, scared them. Um, and now it's like, what do I do with my personal belongings? Most mold reports will say to remove all the contents out of the home while the remediation is being done. The reasoning for that is the cross-contamination. If they're trying to remediate your home and the contents are in there, the contents haven't been cleaned, then there's a lot of finger pointing going as to where the contamination is coming from. Um, I do find that at this, at this point when people are coming to me, it, it's at least 50% or more psychological. Will anything be clean enough? Will anything be good enough? Should I save it? I think that we have to think in terms of um, harder to replace, sentimental items, everything's broken down into porous, non-porous, and semi-porous. But if you do not have physical uh, mold growth, I'm sorry, visible and physical, but visible mold growth on your personal contents in your home, then they can be cleaned, especially professionally cleaned according to the IICRC S520 guidelines, which is how uh, how we clean things. We also use um, some uh, fogging products that are um, safe, you know, natural, green, environmentally friendly uh, products that uh, Mold uh, Mark actually turned us on to 
for Indiana from US enzyme. But fogging, fogging with those are going to get the hidden spots that us as humans can miss. So they don't, they don't have to throw everything away, but they also have to determine um, what works for them, what's cost effective to put through the process. And as far as, uh, as we go, we do everything from bags of laundry to people in the, in an Escorta wash system that you kind of mentioned earlier, um, all the way to full pack out, pack back and cleaning services. So uh, it, it's all a uh, very long drawn out conversations on what they should or should, should keep and shouldn't maybe. And, and uh, also according to their lifestyle and budget needs and things like that. Yeah. And it's a conversation that you have with people. So you, you're helping them through this process. It's not up to them to determine everything on their own. And it's so nice to mm -hmm. have people on your team where you can field questions to, to like this. So I think it's a really important piece of this, this whole mold picture. Um, you brought up porous, non-porous, semi-porous. Can you kind of go through that? Cause I think people are probably at home. You know, we have a lot of people that have tested positive for mold, their houses have on the call. So I want them to leave with a lot of tangibles and things that they can actually implement. Um, but what do you mean by that? And like, what do you mean by each of those things and how does it change whether you can keep it, whether you can clean it, whether you got to toss it? Okay, well, we're gonna say that you, you can almost keep anything that doesn't have visible mold on it, but the really safe items when we uh, are non-porous items, anything, dishes, pots, pans, silverware, glass, ceramics, anything that basically can be dunked in a sink of water and washed, and it's, a, it's a, usually a shiny finished surface, so it's not gonna hold those mold spores. And when you get into semi-porous, uh, an example of a semi-porous item might be a dresser. Okay, you're going to have a, a wood finish, most likely on that dresser, that's very easy to clean. Okay, and we say clean, there, is, there are definitely different cleaning methods for mold. I know there's no way to, to go into those, but to, we're gonna, so when we use the term clean, we're saying clean for mold, where we can clean that finished surface on a dresser, but you're also dealing with the semi-porous surfaces, which is gonna be the back of the dresser, inside the drawers, where you have unfinished wood surfaces. So a lot of, uh, even a upholstered dining room chair, where the wood is basically gonna be uh, somewhere between semi-porous and non-porous because it has a finish on it, yet you have your upholstered seat, which is now porous. Okay, so porous meaning anything that can absorb, uh, absorb the mold spores and any kind of um, uh, temperature, temperature change, growth from the humidity, things that we can't see with our eyes. And then also like a mattress, a mattress is completely porous and we can only really clean the surface of a mattress. You can't get all the way to the interior of the mattress. And that's where we start advising. We basically take a look at uh, a lot of the reports that the mold guys send us. And we might see that, that the, uh, the mold spore counts and the types of mold in the master bedroom are off the charts. But yet, but yet in the living room, they hardly found nothing. And that's when we started advising, you know what, dispose of your mattress, your bed pillows, um, you know, things like that that are porous in that bedroom. And it's probably the main, it is the main reason why I generally, one of the first things I ask our potential clients that are calling me for help is, do you have any, uh, any test results that you can send me? Because they're going to start asking me. Can I save this picture? Can I save this book? Can I save this pillow? And honestly, the answers are different for everybody. So I try to take the, the mold reports that people do and then advise the best that I can based on porous, semi-porous, and non-porous and where their real indications in their home are high levels. Yeah. And... Is, does it have any impact on how long somebody was actually in the location? We, we have a lot of mold in Los Angeles and, you know, I've had friends going through this, but they're moving in somewhere. They've only been there for a few weeks, testing, realizing it, and then getting out. Um, you mean like as far as the exposure, like how yeah, long something exposure was time. exposed to it? I think for sure it does, because if you do general, and, and Mark can probably uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it has to do, you know, if you have contents that have been in your home for years and you've had this mold problem in your, you know, for years, I think of mold spores just like you would dust. 
So we dust our homes, we dust the surfaces, but there's always some areas that don't get dusted. And let, let's face it, not everybody lives the same. Some people have a little bit more. I see it on Mark's, uh, on Mark's reports. It might say a little clutter, a little clutter in the corner or whatever, but all of that promotes dust. So if somebody's been in, in, an, in, a, in a new apartment for three months and it comes up with uh, mold spores, the chances of settlement are gonna be less than they would be if they lived in this home for 10 years and they've had mold in there the whole time. Because every time you're cleaning and you're wiping down, you're basically wiping off, wiping off the dust. Mark, yeah. do you agree with that? I do. I, I, uh, I think that uh, this is very much individualized. When it comes to contents, it's very, very difficult conversation, as you know, because the real question is how clean is clean? And that's going to be different from individual to individual. And so uh, you can certainly, I tell people all the time, you want to take an inventory of everything that you have. And the most important thing is going to be those things that have sentimental value because you can't really put a price on things that are of sentimental value. And then you have these things that are high cost items. And then you have things that really don't have a whole lot of value at all. So at the end of the day, you have to take a look at you as an individual, your sensitivity levels, your acceptability to certain types of items. And I will tell you that um, not every type of item is going to be the same in terms of people's acceptability after it's clean, right? So it may take one person one time, it could take a couple of times, or it may take even uh, a number of more times or not even at all for them to accept it, right? So it makes it really, really difficult. And I tell them that the most important thing that you can do is to categorize these items and think about what's going to be important, taking those things, think about storing them somewhere and really focusing your attention on your health, right? Because at the end of the day, and this is what Dr. Williams brought up earlier, is that it's about avoidance. And so once you start avoiding the exposure, then you can start working on your clinicals and doing the things that you need to do. And then you have those contents cleaned. And as you do, I think being a minimalist is really important during this time when you minimize the amount of things that you have within your environment in terms of just the, the what I call the bare necessities to really do what you need to do as you're getting your health into a much stronger type of position. Because as your immune system builds up and you become stronger, your acceptability levels start to become stronger as well. So this is a very difficult conversation when it comes to contents. And this is my experience and my opinion. It's not the same for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, and I want to, I think this is a great point or place to tie in another question that we're asked a lot. And I would like to start with you, Mark, and see what your answer is. But I'd actually like everybody's feedback on the panel about this. You know, where do fil air filters come into play here? Do you find any of them being effective um, in, in terms of more prevention? Or can they play a role in all of this at all? Well, I think first off, uh, air filters are going to be a good tool to use. Uh, you can use those in the interim in terms of, uh, you know, waiting for remediation and trying to do the things that you need to do to get yourself to where you need to be to remediate your place. So there's one, what I call timeline of when you can use those. And the other time is definitely on an ongoing maintenance perspective. I am a big proponent of the air, fil air filtration units and the utilization of those. And I think that you can actually establish certain types of zones within your home where you can actually try to create an environment specifically in your bedroom, because that's where you spend most of your time, your body's regenerating itself. You really want to have the, the least amount of clutter you can within that room. And then bringing in devices such as that, I think would be a very good idea. Yeah. And do you recommend one specifically, or I know Dr. Williams will have something to to chime in here I, you know more. what i i don't really recommend specific units that are out there but there are uh units that uh, people can certainly do the research i mean there are many different ones that are out there i like ones that have the ability to actually have air filtration in terms of HEPA filtration capabilities, as well as creating certain types of, of what I call negative ions to help reduce a lot of the um, microbial elements that are floating around in the air. So there's different units that are out there. 
there isn't one in particular that I would tell you is better than the other. I really haven't spent a whole lot of time investigating those, to be honest with you. Okay. Dr. Williams, do you have anything to add with that? Yep, I'm totally in agreement with Mark. I'm always recommending a HEPA air filter, especially if someone is unable to move out of the environment. I think that it's very crucially important to have them, you know, honestly throughout your house if you're able to, because it's just going to be so important to filter the air that way. Some that I recommend and have done some research behind is Air Doctor Pro is a really nice one and IQ Air. Those are some big ones that I really recommend. Yeah, that, that's IQ Air is what I'm seeing the most of. Okay, good. So we got some, some it, things. To, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, wonderful. And I, Lori, I want the I want to bring this back to you because I want to talk about a few things. One of them is, you know, you have this Asporta wash system. So I want to go into why that's special and like kind of di discussing can people just wash their clothes in a regular washer machine on high heat and is it is that good enough? And where does the Asporta come in and all of this? You know, I get that I get that question a lot, and I get everything from borax to vinegar and all the above. And honestly, I mean, I hear you can read on the internet about a lot of it, and I'm not going to say that it doesn't work because there's a good chance that it does. The, the one of the mis misnomers of contents is just unless you can test it, how do you know for sure? So the reason that we push, I guess, the Asporta machine is, um, and I looked this up, I sent it to Mary, I don't know if you can, you're going to be able to flash that on the screen or not, the uh, Asporta uh, website, and then there was a blog about, and, and actually on Asporta they have for mold sensitized uh, individuals. But the, the Asporta wash system has been proven to remove things like mold spores, staph, bacteria, infection. They're even starting, uh, starting to promote it for things if they think that they've been exposed to the coronavirus. So it's a, it's a peroxide, green, friendly, clean, but it's a mixture of the chemicals. It's a giant washing machine. And, and that, is, that is what it was built for with things like this. When, when people put their clothing and their cleanables through the Asporta machine, I tell them don't even waste your money on testing because I'm really that confident in the machine. So I don't want to evade your question except for to say that I'm not an industrial hygienist. And so commenting on, you know, I get it. Hot water, borax, vinegar, this, that. I think one of the biggest things somebody can do if they're trying to do their own home laundry, number one is it has to be washed in a different environment than what you're living in. So no matter what, if your home is contaminated, if your air is contaminated and you're washing the clothes in the same house that hasn't been remediated, it doesn't matter what you put in your washer because they're going to go through the dryer, which is pulling in air from the house. And then you're taking them out of the dryer and you're folding them and you're storing them in the same environment that they're in. So if somebody wants to try a home method, I would advise a different washing machine altogether. You know, your parents, your sister, your brother, whatever, somewhere else. And that you would wash and fold them out of your environment and then wear them and see how your body reacts to them. Because I don't have a proven home method. Yeah, and I think, so when Lori and I originally met, you know, we saw pictures of the facility and what they're doing there, um, but they're so meticulous in terms of they're unpacking outside of the facility. They're putting them in different containers. They're bringing them into the facility, washing them, taking them out, putting them, I mean, it's like, it's very controlled. Um, for somebody who's type A, I'm like, ooh, I like this. A lot of organization here. And so you're, you're really going above and beyond. And then the other thing that you mentioned is that you're testing the product. So you have a lot more security in knowing, yes, this does not have. Actually, we don't. We don't. And I just want to correct just to make sure. We yeah. don't test it. Uh, we don't need to if it comes out of the Asporta. And some customers will want their contents tested, but that is the subjectiveness of cleaning contents, is that unless you're gonna test every item, there's, there's no guarantee ever, except for that, it, that it's clean like what you said, in a very controlled environment, according to the IICRC S520 guideline, that kind of thing, so. Got it, thank you for correcting me. But the Asporta has been tested. Yeah, the Asporta has been tested. The, the proven results of the Asporta machine in general 
have been tested by uh, certified mold professionals. Okay, great. Great. Mark, you were in the middle when you got kicked off um, talking about bacteria and not just mold. I don't know if you remember where you are, but I also have another question for you if you don't. You want me to follow up on the bacteria side of it? Is that what you wanted me to do? Yeah, maybe just really maybe just wrap yeah. that up so we get. Yeah, a good I'll just I'll that. just wrap that up just to say that there's other types of microbes that you really want to be uh, very much aware of when it comes to uh, water issues and uh, water damage. And so we talked about the the gram negative with the endotoxins, and then you also have uh, the gram positive, which um, we test with actinomycetes and actinobacterium that uh, actually characteristically, when you're looking at this, very similar to mold, they can sporulate, they can actually put off MVOCs, which are those musty odors. They can even produce uh, what we call biotoxins. So the immune response to these bacteria, very similar to that of mold exposure. And so we try to provide as much data that we can in terms of what is going on within your home. And these are the more progressive sampling methods that we uh, actually utilize. Okay, great. I think we're gonna get some questions about that from the audience too. And Dr. Williams, I want to move it back to you. Um, we've gotten a couple questions that have come in already. And you know, when somebody goes through mold treatment, what should they be expecting for a timeline here if we're assuming that they've left their environment? Yep. So if they've left the environment, it people will usually start feeling better, honestly, within days. I've seen that so many times with my patients, but to fully heal and retest and everything come out clear, as long as they're not still being exposed, it's usually at least three to six months, maybe longer than that. Okay. So it can be up to six months, but even potentially longer. And you are retesting too. So especially probably if things aren't getting better. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And what if people are unable to leave their environment? Because I think that's a really important one to touch on because not everybody has the finances to leave and there's a lot of factors that go into that. Yep. So we can still initiate all the recommendations that I said earlier, a binder, sauna, antifungals. That's all going to be really important just to detox it as much as possible, even though you're still going to be continually getting exposed. So we're still going to do all of that. I really recommend keeping the humidity levels low, like 30 to 50% is what's really shown to be beneficial. So getting a dehumidifier, opening up your windows if you're able to, and then like we said, getting a HEPA air filter that's going to be really important. Another thing too is just making sure that you have an anti-inflammatory diet as well. So some of the foods that have shown to have higher contents of mold are things like peanuts, corn, grains, coffee, dried fruits. Those are some big ones that I'm typically recommending to avoid. Um, and then just making sure that you are avoiding some of those higher inflammatory foods like gluten, dairy, processed sugars, refined sugars, oils like canola oil. So we can work from a dietary perspective too and just make sure that we are getting the inflammation calmed down as much as we can in that perspective. I'm always recommending liver supportive foods too. Brassicas are huge, which is what we call cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, broccoli sprouts, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Those are going to be really important just to help our own body detoxify. Yeah, because we do have to remember our body has the innate ability to heal itself. And this is, you know, an empowering piece that I would love people to, to leave with. But your body is extremely vital. It has all the things that it needs to heal. Sometimes when the toxin load gets to a certain point, then it becomes much more useful to use these extra things that you talked about in terms of glutathione and in removing yourself from the environment that it should not be in. You know, so some people will ask, you know, we sh if we're able to detoxify them, why do we have to move out of the environment? We're not meant to live in moldy houses. That's not our natural being. You know, we're meant to live in nature actually. So we're pretty far removed from our natural habitat. Um, but, you know, really supporting the body through that process is essential. Yeah. And um, Mark, can you talk about how environmental testing kind of complements the medical labs piece of it? I think you went into a little bit of it before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, one of the things that Dr. Williams had talked about is doing mycotoxin testing. So um, I think the more progressive samples like the ERMI and the mycotoxin and even the, uh, the bacteria samples are really important types of data points for you to see 
what you're actually uh, being exposed to in terms of what's going on in your environment. So the ERMI, as I mentioned to you, you know, a lot of people look at the ERMI and they're looking at the score. I would caution that. I would tell them that the most important thing to look at when you're dealing with the uh, ERMI report is actually the individual molds and species of molds that are actually being detected. That's the most important thing because that will tell you what's been going on in your home, the different types of molds and species and their capabilities. So be real careful with the number. People get a false sense of security when they see a certain number that's coming up on these ERMI reports. And then they also kind of lean towards the, the Hertz B2, which you gotta be real careful. Hertz B2 really is an abbreviated ERMI. It's five organisms that uh, have been created to really kind of give you just a little bit of a sense of what's going on in your environment. And that score itself can actually be very, very deceiving because you're really missing out on many different types of molds that have the ability to be of a health uh, consequence. So. I'm not a big hurts me uh, fan when it comes to looking at that from a reporting perspective. But then the mycotoxins, great uh, type of data point because we can actually test for 15 different mycotoxins. All these different types of tools can be used to sit down and really discuss with your doctor to show them exactly what's going on in your home in terms of the different types of microbes. The actinomyces report, I think that's an amazing report. That's the one for the um, positive uh, bacteria and it's for gram positive and what it is I call it the ERMI for bacteria because what it does it gives you a listing of all the different types of bacteria and the species and it's all there for you to be able to review with your doctor and like I said when you're dealing with a water damaged building mold is is one subset of it there's many different types of things that are going on within your environment that actually could be creating an immune response that may not have anything to do with uh, mold. It could be something else other than that. So a lot of these different types of tools that we provide could be very, very helpful for you. Yeah, great. Lori, we had a panel uh, or an audience question come in for you. Um, somebody with a baby grand piano, they HEPA vacuumed it and cleaned it to remove the dust and mold. Um, is that enough, do you think, if it's a remediated home? Uh, I guess I'd have to say, did they HEPA back the interior of the piano? Because there's a lot of hidden spots inside of, a, inside of the action of a piano, a lot of things they can't get. Um, so it might depend on how, how uh, extensive the mold was in the home, on if they got it good enough, and uh, potentially follow up with a fogging treatment on the interior of that piano, just to make sure if there's hidden spots that they didn't get. So there's, you know, there's a lot of, HEPAVAC, a uh, cu couple of times we've all said it here on this, uh, this panel, and it really is a key word when it comes to mold spores. Even the IICRCS 520 guideline, everything emphasizes almost basically like a HEPAVAC sandwich. Something would be HEPAVAC, it would be cleaned, and then it would be HEPAVAC again. It's kind of known as a HEPAVAC sandwich. So, it, uh, you know, is, is HEPAVACing and cleaning good enough? Probably, but there's also a lot of uh, just hidden, hidden pockets to something like a baby grand piano. Yeah. Okay. So the the answer is maybe if you did it really, uh, no, really comprehensively. Like, yeah, but yeah, no. Yes or no. Right. But but when in doubt, a lot there's there's fogging agents out there that are very effective for uh, mold spores and mycotoxins. So what we can't have the vac, you know, if you're going to keep something like such as a baby grand piano. You're going to HEPA vac and clean it the best you can. And I would say that a, fo that a fogging agent is your, is your next best option for anything that you couldn't reach. Okay, great, great. Um, oh, Esporta. Can you spell Esporta for us? We've got people trying to Google it and they are confused. Yes, yes. Their website, they're Canadian based, so it's W, actually I can type it, I will type it in a second in the, uh, in the chat window too. It's www.esporta.com. Esporta, E S P O R T A dot C A. And Great. I'll go ahead and type that in the chat window. Wonderful. Thank you. And for all the panelists, we'll be giving out their contact information separately. So we won't go through that right now, but you guys will get notified, everybody who's attending. Um, in case you want to work with Lori, Mark, Dr. Williams, we'll make sure to give you their contact information as well. Um, we have a question, and this is an interesting one. Somebody is a gardener and they want to be 
um, they, they're wondering, should they be concerned about mold because they're working with the soil? I actually want to jump in on this one as well, but you know, Mark, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I'm not a big proponent of uh, indoor house plants. As we uh, kind of talked offline, I think it's something that uh, actually promotes a lot of microbial growth with the soil and everything else. So um, my opinion is, is that there's a lot of beautiful uh, artificial plants that are out there and uh, that could be one direction, but I know that there's a lot of people out there that have green thumbs and they prefer to have their, uh, their light plants. Yeah. Yeah. And um, from a gut health perspective, I can't help but jump in. And I think getting your hands in the soil is like one of the best things that you can do, especially assuming you're a gardener, you're outside, there's going to be airflow. You don't have your, you know, necessarily your nose right in the soil, but it's also live soil. So it has turnover to it. Um, you know, you're not, you're not putting something in a container and just letting it sit on your, on your kitchen table for four months. So I really am a proponent just because of the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome that's, you know, a continuation of that, that you want to be exposed to a variety of bacteria that we're supposed to be exposed to as humans. And we see this in the research that people that are exposed to more soils or exposed to more nature have a more vibrant and diverse microbiome, which is one of the biggest indicators of overall health that we have. Um, so I'm, you can hear it in my voice. I'm very passionate about get your hands dirty um, in organic soil and be out in nature as much as possible. So I would can consider that side of the story as well. Um, are house plants helpful? And I think that this is actually coming from an air quality, like filtration standpoint. Dr. Williams, if you want to talk about that. Yes. So I don't know all the ins and outs behind air plants specifically or indoor plants, I should say, but um, they have been shown to help clean our air to some extent. You know, it's not going to act like a HEPA filter and filter everything out, but I think it can be helpful in a small amount to just clean our air to that extent. But as Mark said, maybe it's also promoting growth of microbes you don't want. So I don't know if we actually fully know, but I think that's beneficial. I do know that they have been shown beneficial to our mental health for dep depression, anxiety, just to have you know, a living organism near us. I think that that could be really beneficial from that standpoint. Yeah, that's a good point. And it brings us back to the first discussion that we had where, you know, mold is a piece of the puzzle, but we have to consider our mental health, anxiety, depression, you know, feeling like you are around nature um, and, and having that in your presence too. So we have to balance the pros and the cons and really treat the individual. So is this somebody who, you know, is really struggling with mold and that's the only thing that's going on or are there other things going on, which there almost always are. Um, we have a question from the audience. Any recommendations on people or companies that we can hire to clean our home contents that have had exposure? Um, that is definitely Lori. So we want to make sure that everybody knows that, you know, she's an expert and she's talking about it, but she actually does it herself. Lori, if you want to chat about how you work with people too. Um, we do. I, th I think that the biggest, the hardest challenge and, uh, we're, we're up for it, but it is cleaning contents on site at someone's home. It's, it's a matter of, have they already received air clearance from testing that has cleared their home? And I mean, can the con, you know, can, but we've done it, you know, we tried to cater to everybody's needs, whether you're cleaning the contents on site maybe, and then doing a fogging treatment, but in, but in some respects, it has to work in conjunction with the cleanup of the home. Uh, some people are moving. And I just say, you know what, you bring the contents here, kind of a stopping point before they get to their new house and have them clean before they get to their new house. Um, and some, sometimes it's very cost prohibitive, prohibitive for people to pack everything out of their house, try to clean it and bring it back. So we'll, we'll work with them. It's just, you know, we can all see the, the relevance to separating the contents from the structure and trying to get a handle on each one before we bring them back together. Otherwise, again, there's that potential of cross contamination. Absolutely. But yeah, we do do we do do it or work with, work with people, whatever their individualized needs are. Great. And we have a question from one of your current um, clients, actually, Lori and Mark, and they're they're wondering um, what the difference. Mark, if you can explain. ERMI testing and the difference between that and regular air testing. You did go a little bit into it, but maybe just the highlight there. 
That's an excellent question. So what happens when you do air sampling, air sampling is uh, actually done via a cassette. Uh, and inside that cassette, there's a little uh, slide that's very sticky and they put it on an air pump. And typically the collection time is gonna be about five minutes. And so what happens is, is that they'll put that typically in the middle of a room or uh, maybe um, in a couple different rooms, and then they'll do some outdoor baselines, and then they're gonna make a comparison between your indoor versus your outdoor. And what they're gonna be looking for is that your indoor counts be equal to or less than to what you find the outside. And then the individual mold spores are similar in nature in terms of the different types of molds. So what happens is, is that you're actually looking at things when they analyze it underneath a microscope. And so when they look at it underneath the microscope, what happens is that they're only looking at it from the standpoint of a genera basis. So they're not really giving it an opportunity to speciate. So two things that you have there. Number one, collection time is very short. It's five minutes. It's a snapshot in time. You're dealing with things more at the genera level, which is not really giving you an understanding of the different species that are there. So in essence, you can have aspergillus and penicillium that can be detected in the home as well as in the outdoors, but they could be different species. But then they could be actually looked upon as similar in nature and be overlooked as a problem. So that's one of the issues that you have with air sampling. I, I tell you that if you're only doing air samples, be very, very careful because all it could be giving you is really a false sense of security. You really need to have a much broader picture. Now, when you're doing, dealing with ERMI, it's actually, in my opinion, a better source of being able to look at a historical perspective of what's been going on within your home because it's the settlement of what's been going on. So you'll be able to determine different types of uh, spores and not only the type of genera, but also the species. Even though it's a panel of 36, which is limited, you're still being able to see a really good solid panel of what we call water damage modes, which are 26, that could be very informative in terms of being able to tell you what's going on within your home. Great, yeah. And we have questions on spelling again. So it's ERMI, it's E-R-M-I. Um, yeah, Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. Excuse me. Great, yes. Um, and Question to follow that up with, do you ever see, is there any testing that's actually too sensitive, meaning it's picking up on things that are not important and people are getting false positives? I mean, there isn't an exact science that's out there, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, what we try to do from our perspective is to be very targeted in terms of trying to validate what's going on. So we'll use air samples in very targeted types of situations. We'll use certain types of what we call swab samples, whether they be utilizing a swab or a tape lift, as well as utilizing these more progressive like ERMI, as well as the mycotoxins and the, uh, the endotoxins and the actinos. All of those definitely are newer technologies. Uh, I would tell you that there are different rules of, of uh, thoughts that are out there when it comes to mycotoxins in terms of then actually uh, being able to uh, pick up some cross variances here that may create what they would consider to be a false positive. But from what we've seen in terms of the, the uh, samples, and we've done thousands of samples, we clearly see that there's definitely a difference between what we're picking up when it comes to the mycotoxins because we can actually relate those mycotoxins to the different types of molds and species of molds that are in the home. So by doing a more broader type of sampling method where you're utilizing the DNA from ERMI and the mycotoxin sampling, now you can do cross-referencing cross to see if there's certain molds that are there that have the ability to produce these mycotoxins. Yeah, it's almost like a confirmatory, like this is giving us a little bit more information. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we have another question. Um, is there a 100% chance of having mold growth if there is a water intrusion or a leak in a house if the water damaged materials are not addressed right away? And how quickly would mold begin to grow after a water leak or intrusion event at your home? Mark, this is all you. 
Yeah, it's all me. And thank you for that question. It's a great question because here's what I'm going to tell you. If there's a water event, there is a 100% likelihood that there's going to be a mold problem if you're not dealing with it properly. Again, everything's based on volume of water. If you drop a glass of water and you clean it up, you know, that's one thing. But if you're talking about large volumes of water, you're talking about some type of pipe leak or some type of water intrusion issue, then there, and if you're not really dealing with it right away, there is going to be a 100% chance, not just mold, but also other microbes that can actually grow. So uh, as we talked about earlier on, you have different categories of water loss that actually can determine various types of, of what I call biologicals or other contaminants that can be carried into it. There's three different categories, category one, two, and three. Category one being what we call clean water, which I would argue there's no such thing because the minute it hits the substrate, it actually becomes what I would consider to be category two, which is gray water. That would carry various types of contaminants. And then category three, which would be the worst kind, which could be from a sewage loss or rainwater or some type of uh, major flood incident that you have there, could carry many different types of biologicals and contaminants that could be of a severe health issue. So again, it really depends on the category of water loss. And certainly if you're just letting it uh, go on, is going to be a major likelihood 100% of the time is my experience that you'll see some type of microbial growth. Okay. Your good. time factor in that, Mary, on that question, just to tag on to what Mark said, your time factor is going to be huge here. How quickly did you address it and remove maybe the water damage uh, um, building components, drywall, flooring, whatever it, whatever it takes versus some real, really long-term leak or shower pan leak or something that somebody just didn't, uh, you know, gives it time to grow in, into the wall. And then, and then Mark also too, right? Isn't it correct that the, the more the length of time, possibly the more toxins that the, that the molds are going to produce versus like a little bit of mildew at first, but it's going to grow and fester and it's going to become more of your toxic molds like stacky and things like that. Is that correct? Absolutely. So certainly if you're going to have a water issue, and again, it's based on certain categories. So keep in mind, if we're talking about mold, we should also be looking at other types of microbes that can actually be of an issue. So the category of water loss, number one would be the issue that you want to look at, but then the time elements, you know, mold can grow as quickly as 24 to 48 hours. Certain bacteria can grow within hours. So, and if you're letting things go, and I thought that was the, the, the item that I heard, if you're letting things go on, then that is going to be something that could be of a, uh, a problem if you're yeah. not really addressing it right away. You need to, as Lori said, you really want to address these things right away. It's right really on. important to do that. Time is of the essence. Yep. Um, Dr. Williams, uh, someone was wondering what the name of the test was. It was the real time labs and then the Great Plains mycotoxin test. And then do you want to touch briefly on the Marcons test before we wrap up here too? Yes. So the Marcons test is looking at mold colonies and bacteria that have become resistant to antibiotics if you have like chronic sinus infections. But if we are getting too much bacteria or mold colonies in our sinus, then we can actually test that through a test called Marcons through a company called Microbiology DX. It's just a nasopharyngeal swab and they will test for fungus, they will test for bacteria, and then they will also test for biofilms. So biofilms are what we are seeing is encapsulating bacteria, mold, all these different microbes and making it harder to get rid of. So that's a great test to use too, especially if, a lot of, if the person has a lot of sinus congestion or sinus infections. Yeah, so person specific for sure, but congestion, um, you know, like allergic like symptoms, chronic sinusitis, acute sinusitis, um, especially po um, paired with if they tested positive for, for mold as well. Yep. Yeah, and you had mentioned one of the treatments for that, if you, the, the specific nasal spray, if you just want to repeat that one again so people can. Yep. So BEG is one of them. That is two antibiotics combined with EDTA, which is a binding agent. And then also what I use more often is called Argentin 23, which is colloidal silver nasal spray. Great. Um, one last question here is, um, this one is for, for Mark. How do you test for molds or toxins inside of walls, under floors, basically like areas that you can't actually get to? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So the number one thing that we would do in that particular situation would be based on historical uh, events. So that would be a scenario that you may have seen or known about some type of water event that impacted a wall, or we see some type of uh, water damage. And in those cases, what we'll do is that we'll create a hole about the size of a dime, we'll stick a tube in there and we'll actually pull the air to determine if there's anything that's going on from that particular uh, area, confined space. So we do what we call wall cavities, and that would be one of the ways that you can actually determine what's going on behind the walls. Great, okay, thank you guys so much. We're approaching 1.30 here, so we're gonna wrap it up. And I wanted to thank each of the panelists for joining and sacrificing your lunch hour to educate us all on mold, how it can affect us from a health perspective, but also from an environmental perspective and how we clean up after we detect the mold. So thank you guys so much. We're gonna send out an email with everybody's contact information um, as well as some other things too. So be on the lookout for that. And if you want, you can work with Lori directly. You can work with Mark and the mold guys and you can work with Dr. Williams for a one-on-one -on -one consult around health too. But thank you guys so much. Anything else you guys wanted to add before we jump off? No, I just see a ton of Q&A and chats in there, and I know that people have questions we probably didn't get to. So um, for all of you, we thank you so much for joining us on your lunch hour today. And uh, just know that whoever your question is directed to, as uh, Dr. Mary sends out, uh, sends out our information, you're welcome to uh, e email us and uh, ask us the questions that didn't get answered today. So thank you. Yeah, and, and Mary and Dr. Williams and Lori, thank you so thank much. You. This was really enjoyable. I really appreciate uh, your 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 expertise as well. Actually, it was a learning experience for me too. So I want you to know that uh, it was very productive for uh, for myself. And uh, again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to join you today. And uh, I hope this was helpful for the people that were listening in. We're getting tons of comments that it was. So thank each and every one of you. <laughs> And I hope everybody has an amazing day and we'll probably be back with more mold information as well, as well as other health information. So have, have a wonderful maybe day. Maybe a part, maybe thank a part you. two. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Thank you guys. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.